Thank you very much, Don. And I'd like to thank the symposium organizers and the foundation for this chance to talk to you this morning. But the work that we're doing to, along with an international community, advance our ability to predict the future. As we've already heard this morning, uh, many of the questions that we want to ask are what-if questions, and they involve questions about the future. Uh, there are questions, in some cases, for which we do not have historical precedent. We don't really have evidence from the written uh, human historical record how to anticipate uh, nature and society will respond to some of the challenges that we're facing. These challenges include how are we altering the climate. As we've heard, that pace is quite fast, and as we heard from Ralph's talk, that pace is accelerating. We also know that the climate has been altered by human emissions, but there are other ways in which we could alter it in the future. And those include some that we're not used to thinking about, like, the, for example, the changes to the land surface. And finally, and perhaps most critically, as we heard from Chris, the key question is how can we shift to a sustainable future, one which we can maintain not only for decades, but for centuries and hopefully for millennia. These are all questions about the future, and in order to address them, we really need a crystal ball. And climate models have been developed in some sense as both a means of integrating our knowledge about the Earth system and also for projecting the future. So these are our crystal ball. And the crystal ball has a lot of facets on it. So I wanted, I'm going to talk to you today about the work that we're doing to advance this ability to predict the future. And the two key components of the model that I'll keep referring to over and over again are the processes in the model. So this is sort of a schematic, a cartoon of all the different processes that operate in the climate system, clouds, sea ice, the ocean, et cetera. And we solve uh, for all these different processes on a world that's been broken up into a set of tiles, and what I'm going to refer to as a grid. The finer the grid, the better able we are able to resolve, whether at regional to local to even finer scales. So the two things that we want out of a climate model are completeness and fidelity of these processes with respect to the real world, to nature, and as fine a grid as, whoops, possible. We need a little bit of help recovering. Thank you. As fine a grid as possible in order to resolve these changes where people live. Let's see, and someone just took the remote offline. Could we advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. One of the areas in which we've been making great progress in the last uh, uh, 30 years is in representation of processes in the climate system. Early models were very simple. They essentially had a, a crude representation of the hydrological cycle, along with emissions of greenhouse gases. Over the last 30 years, we've added other important components to the climate system. Uh, for example, the oceans. These are the major reservoir of heat in the climate system. Uh, and we've also added the cooling effects of aerosols, and now a, a more complete representation of atmospheric chemistry, along with the interaction of these processes with the land surface. So vegetation also plays a very important and critical role in governing the carbon cycle, and that's been added in the last 10 years or so. So the models have increased in complexity, and they've also increased in their resolution. So this is a uh, representation of Europe circa 1990, and you may notice that you can't see the Pyrenees or the Alps uh, in this picture. Thanks to recent advances in resolution by a factor of about four, we now are able to resolve the orography of Europe. So here are the Pyrenees, here are the Alps. Greenland is no longer a small dimple. It's a, it's a real a continent in its own right. And the next generation of climate models will improve on this by a factor of two to three. This has all been thanks to a massive increase in computing power over the last 30 years. This is the increase in computing power at a center that we've used for uh, climate assessment here in Berkeley, uh, a center for energy research. And we've increased the computing power at that center over the last 30 years by a factor of 400 million. So give or take a factor of two by a factor of a billion. And that has enabled us to study climate with unprecedented uh, fidelity and realism. And let me show you uh, one of the predictions from a model that we used in the last IPCC assessment and what it says about the future. So this is what a typical climate model output looks like. I'm starting with the Charney Report in 1979. 
And what we're looking at is the anomaly in surface temperature relative to pre-industrial times. And so the warm colors indicate that the planet has gotten a little bit hotter, say about two degrees, relative to uh, the pre-industrial past. And you'll notice that this pattern as we go forward into the future just sort of amplifies gradually. Uh, the biggest changes are seen at high latitudes where the continents get warmer by five or six degrees Celsius. And I should also point out that the scenario that was shown here was something that we thought was sort of middle of the road. As it turns out, the pace of carbon dioxide increase in the recent past has exceeded even uh, the worst case scenario that we examined, which is one in which carbon dioxide triples by the end of the 21st century. So what this model shows you is that by the end of the century, we've warmed the planet by an average of three degrees Celsius, which isn't much compared, for example, to the general temperature, to the, uh, I should say, the annual temperature range in Chicago, uh, which is close to about uh, 40 to 50 degrees Celsius, but it is a major change to the climate of, the high, of all the northern regions of the continents, Canada, Russia, all warming by five to six, seven degrees Celsius, there are 10 million square kilometers of frozen soil left over from the last glacial period, all of which are beginning to melt thanks to recent warming. And we think that this pulse of uh, additional heating will accelerate that melting even faster. So this is the state of the art circa three years ago. And a number of people on the program have contributed heavily to this particular model, which is a, a, a model that's freely available to the global climate community. But it's not complete for two important reasons. The first is, as Chris mentioned, and as Ralph mentioned, the pace of change is accelerating. It's not staying on a constant trend line. We're seeing faster and faster and dramatic changes. If we just choose 2009, in fact, one month in 2009 as an example, here are three news stories that came out that indicated how quickly the world around us is changing. And the change in particular in the Arctic is faster than certainly this model just showed you predicted. First commercial transit across the Arctic Ocean recorded last year. As Ralph mentioned, 200 cubic kilometers, roughly 50 cubic miles of ice being lost from, from Greenland every year. And as you can see from this, the change in slope, that pace of change is accelerating. And of course, a reliable scientific journal, the Huffington Post, <laughs> uh, suggesting that the Northern Pole summers may be ice-free in a decade. And that's probably a little bit exaggerated. But nonetheless, the pace of change is quite rapid. So our models are underpredicting the rate of change. And the second thing that the models have left out is essentially the feedback from climate on policy back onto climate mitigation. So, so far we've sort of added, we've treated humans as if they're an external forcing agent on the climate system. That's not very realistic. We expect that as the pace of change accelerates, the people will begin to respond. And so we need to integrate policy formation as an important climate feedback in these models. They have not, uh, to date, included this feedback from policy formation. We should include it. For that reason, the community and the community here at Berkeley that's working on climate change have moved on to a new framework for treating climate, one in which we're not just predicting climate change, but we're also including the very critical feedback loop from climate through the consequences to how that will drive policy back to mitigation measures back to new measures for uh, generating energy that are more sustainable. And our goal here is really to develop a unified predictive framework for modeling the human Earth system as a coupled system. The two aspects that I'm going to focus on today are fast climate processes. We already heard about these this morning. These, I think, will be, they're both important as stressors to society and to the environment, but they also may be important triggers to prompt even faster changes in policy. So I'll talk about these uh, during the middle of my talk. The next thing that we need is a test bed for climate solutions, so essentially a way of looking out into the future and asking if we deploy this technology at scale, uh, how much climate change will it mitigate? Uh, is it a sustainable technology? So this is another role for climate modeling that's now emerging as an important development. And I should say that I've labeled this as a Berkeley lab framework, but I don't want to be parochial. This is being done with a, a large international community. Uh, we have partners in the United States and in Europe, and there are a number of other laboratories that are also undertaking this uh, bold step forward. So let me start with fast climate processes. 
Abrupt and extreme climate change represent a major challenge for us. We haven't heard about abrupt climate change yet. It's sort of a large scale shift in the climate system. Essentially, the, the climate system goes from one state to another and then stays there. And these changes can be quite disruptive, both to society and to the environment, because we have relied on the stability of the climate system for the last 10,000 years, since the formation of agrarian society. It's been a critical aspect of how we have uh, set up our, both our industry and our agriculture and the deployment of our cities. So major changes that, that suddenly shift and then last would disrupt that historical pattern of human behavior. The other type of change that we've uh, cr heard about from Chris is extreme climate change, for example, heat waves. Climatologically unusual events like heat waves could become more frequent, and these can exceed the thresholds for adaptation. Essentially, you can't adapt because the, the weather has, has changed so dramatically over such a short period of time that your normal means of coping doesn't work anymore. These types of change pose a major challenge to us, and climate models, as it has shown you, which sort of gradually change over time, have really not been instrumented yet to account for these phenomena. So this is an, a major area of research for us. And the ones that I'm gonna to talk to you about are sea level rise from land ice, faster warming from ocean hydrates that Ralph alluded to in his talk, and more frequent heat waves and tropical storms. So let me start with uh, sea level rise. We've already heard about Greenland and how quickly it's losing ice. Models that were used in the last IPCC assessment suggested that Greenland would gradually, uh, could gradually melt if we got it up to a critical threshold, some of the range of two and a half to three degrees Celsius warmer than its historical temperature, and it would then gradually lose its volume over the next 2,000 years. Now that, that gradual change sounds benign, but if it melts, sea level would rise by uh, over seven meters, about 23.6 feet, 24 feet, threatening a lot of the world's major coastal cities. So this would be a, have a major impact, but on the scale of 2,000 years. And currently, as Ralph mentioned, we're seeing about half a millimeter per year sea level rise due to Greenland. These models, though, uh, Greenland is not sort of losing ice volume like a big ice cube. In fact, it's a very dynamic system. And it's helpful to look at the, the um, satellite data that Ralph alluded to, to see what the key features are. So this is the, the, that same space-based data. And what it's showing you is that the ice loss is occurring around the perimeter of Greenland. Most of the ice loss, two-thirds of it, is dynamic. It's not thermodynamic. It's not like an ice cube melting. It's because ice is flowing out to sea. And the fact that these colors are cool and blue means that you're seeing a dramatic loss of ice from the edges of the ice sheet. There's a time trend here showing the, the same graph that we've now shown a couple of times. So land ice is very dynamic. So let's ask, could, the, could we lose ice from the edges of Greenland uh, faster than 2,000 years? And the answer is yes, and we're just now beginning to incorporate this physics into models of uh, land ice. What I want you to focus on is this graph in the upper left-hand corner. This is an ice sheet that's about a kilometer thick. It's typical, that's typical thickness for the edges of the Greenland ice sheet. And it's sloping uh, downhill from left to right toward the ocean. So the ocean is off to the right-hand side of this graph. Let's imagine that through some process we managed to introduce melting at the base of this glacier. So imagine we have a kilometer thick uh, sheet of ice, very heavy, and we lubricate the base just by a little bit. We melt, in essence, uh, enough ice to represent the thickness of a dime in one year and then maintain that. What happens is that you induce very large velocities in the ice sheet, close to a third of a kilometer per year. That's, that's racing speed for a glacier. You let that loose, and in just 100 years, you've deflated the glacier by over a factor of two. So you can get dramatic ice loss in very short periods of time uh, if you manage to melt the base. And as a result, uh, we think it's really important to include these dynamic processes in a whole new generation of land models. Uh, IPCC basically hedged on whether sea level rise could be much larger than 30 centimeters, which is the current trend. Uh, the key uncertainty is future dynamic flows in, uh, future dynamic changes in ice flow. 
We've established an initiative here at Berkeley, along with colleagues at six of the laboratories, to develop more reliable sea level projections precisely by dealing with the dynamics at the edges of the ice sheets. I won't show you projections from that now because this project is very new, like all the other projects I'm going to show you this morning. Uh, but we have launched this initiative and hope to have simulations ready by next year. Second major source of uncertainty I'd like to talk to you about are methane hydrates. Methane hydrates, these are, this is a combination of uh, water and methane on the ocean floor. The basic thing I want you to take away from this uh, pie graph is that the amount of methane st stored on the ocean floor in this form is roughly comparable with, say, a factor of two of the recoverable fossil fuel inventories. So there's an appreciable amount of carbon stored in the climate system in the form of hydrates. Now, why would one think that it wouldn't stay there? The reason is that we're uh, heating, thanks to global warming, the water at the continental shelves where this hydrate is stored, and some of those largest changes will occur in the Arctic Basin, where we're projecting five, six degrees centigrade increases at the, uh, at the continental shelf itself. So could warmer oceans melt the hydrates? And if this methane gets loose, either as methane or uh, it's oxidized to carbon dioxide, could that enhance the greenhouse effect? This is a, a, a central open question. There's been a lot of debate about this based on the paleoclimate uh, record. We actually think it's worth revisiting this using uh, techniques that aren't based on equilibrium arguments. So we've now begun an effort uh, with a number of colleagues to first confront models of this process against observations. This is, uh, these observations are taken right off the coast of Norway. This is a sonar record of methane plumes. So here's the ocean floor. Here are plumes of, of methane rising several hundred meters from the ocean floor toward the ocean surface, which is up here. So each spike represents a plume of methane. We can observe methane hydrate uh, from a number of sites all around the Arctic Basin. You can get very similar looking spikes out of a model without any special tuning. You basically set it up, subject it to historical warming, and it will produce a record of plumes that look exactly like the sonar record. No problem. So what happens if you take that model and run it forward in time and subject it to sort of reasonable projections of what might, might happen over the 21st century? The key thing I want you to notice about this graph is that, well, okay, the flux changes. And the flux here is in, in um, tons of metric tons of methane per year per square kilometer of the ocean floor, so it's a large number. But the other key feature is to notice that once the, uh, the system turns on, it stays level for a long time, for centuries, and the switch on is very abrupt. So this is an example of that kind of fast climate change that we're interested in. We don't yet know the consequences of this type of emission for the climate system, but we have constructed a model with which to study it. So we have our model of the methane release here. We're coupling it with the ocean and then coupling it with the rest of the climate system. And again, we hope to have projections from this system in the next year or so uh, for input into the next uh, international and national set of assessments on climate change. Third major type of rapid change are climate extremes. Uh, Chris alluded to these. This is a projection uh, for heat waves over China. Uh, and what it shows is that heat waves that used to occur over every 20 years or so start occurring every three years or so by the end of the 21st century for quite middle of the road projections for carbon dioxide. This graph was developed at Lawrence Berkeley and then translated into Chinese and presented to the Chinese by Steve Chu, uh, Secretary of uh, the Department of Energy, uh, when he visited this past year. So, uh, and of course, China has now its own uh, quite robust climate modeling uh, groups, so they're fully aware of this message, as are we. This, this pattern, by the way, shows up all over the Northern Hemisphere. It's not just China. It's in North America. It's in Europe. Um, it's in Russia. You see this dramatic increase in the frequency of heat waves. Well, fortunately, our models are now getting uh, good enough to, we think, be able to provide robust predictions of these extremes, so at least we're not going to be left in the dark. Thanks to the increase in grid resolution that I mentioned to you, our models, which used to be at a fairly coarse resolution so they could barely resolve the state of California, are now at the level where they can resolve things the size of, roughly the size of counties in the United States. And their fidelity compared to the observations of extremes, and this is a particular type of extreme, it's a very strong rainfall event that only occurs every 20 years or so, that fidelity of the model to the observations has been increasing steadily as we've added resolution to the models. 
So that's a good, uh, good news message. We've now increased the uh, capability of these models sufficiently that we can begin looking at an even more uh, severe type of extreme climate change, namely hurricanes. This is work from a colleague of mine, uh, Michael Weiner, at Berkeley Laboratory. A number of other groups in the United States and worldwide are now at the cusp of being able to simulate severe tropical storms. This looks like a satellite image of a tropical storm, but in fact, it's a simulation. And the distinguishing feature of the simulation is that you can see the arms of the hurricane, you can see the, the, the eye of the hurricane and the eye wall. This has only recently become possible with advances in computing. So we can now simulate hurricanes down to their, their native scale. And one of the key questions for us going forward is um, the change in the statistics of hurricanes compared to present day. So this is simulated tropical storm numbers. 2,000 is shown in blue, with roughly 70 or so major tropical storms uh, a year, which is roughly comparable to the climatology. And this particular model projected that the total number of tropical storms would increase by roughly 30% in the future. Of course, a number of these storms are relatively benign, so they're category one storms, uh, storms that we can easily weather. The key question is whether or not category four hurricanes, which are uh, incredibly disruptive, will increase dramatically over the 21st century. There's been a lot of debate based on the, the observational record, uh, whether or not this has occurred in the, in the historical observations. And the, the models currently do not agree on the sign of this effect. So we still have quite a bit more research to do to understand this. But the message I want to give to you is that we now have models, at least, that we can compare to against each other. And they do a remarkably uh, good job of simulating these tropical storms. This is a movie, again, taken from the next generation of the climate model we've been developing. You can see these beautiful, uh, well, but destructive uh, tropical storms <laughs> <coughs> spinning up in the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. It's producing very realistic statistics. Of course, the key question is now what happens when you subject this to a warmer climate? What will it do? So I've shown you three challenges, three types of very rapid climate change that could occur that we think could act to spur uh, policy, especially once these begin manifesting themselves in the climate system. These are all a reflection of the fact that we've been conducting a geophysical experiment on a very large scale. And one of the people who, who's captured this most eloquently is Roger Revelle, a really great scientist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He wrote this in a, an early prescient paper in the late 1950s talking about the role of the oceans in the carbon cycle. And he pointed out that we're conducting an experiment. It's really sort of an unintended experiment on the planet um, that hasn't happened in the past because of the, pa the pace is so unusual. Nor, it can't be, uh, nor could it be re reproduced in the future because we're taking 400 million years of legacy of carbon out of the ground and tossing it into the atmosphere. Yeah, that's not going to happen again for a while. Uh, do we want to repeat this experiment? I would think not. And so there's another piece of wisdom that's useful to, uh, <laughs> to consider, which is look before you leap. And I, I went back and looked to see where this came from. It turns out it's, it's English. Uh, it is anonymous about four centuries uh, prior to Roger Revelle's thinking on this topic. But this is really a message that I think you'll hear over and over in this symposium, that we've now developed the capability, and, and Chris mentioned this as well, we have the capacity now to look before we leap. And so what we've been doing at, at Berkeley is developing this capability through improved projection of the interactions between humans and the Earth system. As Chris alluded to, there have been models like this that have looked at the interactions of, e of energy markets and economics and climate for some time. The, the innovation that we're making is to take those energy market models and couple them with a, a, a state-of-the-art climate models we can find so that we will have very realistic projections of the consequences of energy choices. And we're just, we've now just developed the prototype of the system. So here's our, our model of the climate system. We've now added an energy market to the land surface so we can look at the consequences of, of biofuels on carbon exchange from the land surface. We can ask how will changes in wind and sun change the ability to deploy sustainable wind and solar power. So the, 
utility of this kind of capability is to test the sustainability of new technologies. So our initial goal is to look at biofuel sustainability. That's an obvious target for this kind of model. Uh, but we can also, and this will be a, a major innovation, study feedbacks from climate and CO2 to the energy markets. We'll be able to, to do this with an unprecedented level of fidelity uh, using this new system. And finally, we'll be able to study other solutions that we'll hear about uh, later this morning, such as carbon capture and sequestration. So this is a, an important addition to our crystal ball for climate change. And with that, I would like to conclude and say that the vision for the future of climate reduction is to get it out of the ivory tower and, and make it, uh, get it out of the global perspective that it has had to date, focus on what's happening locally. That's really where the action is. So our goal now going forward is robust projections of rapid climate change on regional to local scales, and also prospective analyses of energy climate interactions, essentially constructing a periscope to look forward to see how energy technologies will play out, which ones are sustainable, which ones make the most sense, which ones are the most economically viable. This rests on a solid foundation of integrating theory, observations, and computation. And I think most importantly, as we heard from Chris and we'll hear about from the next speaker, this is only possible if we understand the interaction of climate and life Life, not only human life, but life including the entire web uh, of life that sustains the environment on Earth as we know it. With that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your attention and look forward to taking your questions a little bit later. Thank you. Okay, does the volume work? Yes, it sounds like it does. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm a paleontologist, but what I'm going to focus on mostly is this critical issue, which is how are ecosystems likely to respond to sort of climate forcing. And so before getting to that, I just want to sort of deal with the all-important issue of uh, why preserve biodiversity in the first place. I'd just like to say that there are multiple reasons for this. The first, obviously, is what it does for us in a material sense, its role in the hydrologic cycle role in the carbon cycle, obviously, with CO2 and oxygen, role in filtering pollutants. Of course, it's an enormous source of natural products and pharmaceuticals. There's also the quality of life issues. And then for me, uh, one that I think is particularly interesting, particularly as an academic, is that life also holds answers to the questions of our origins and to our nature. If there were no primates alive today, we would know much less about who we are and where we came from than um, would be the case. So many biologists, natural historians, try to examine the biosphere the way it is. And as paleontologists, what we tend to do is see how it becomes. And I think this little commercial captures the sense in which paleontologist operates. Thank you. No, nope. let's go back again. Should we try one more time? You actually have to click the screen, not push the forward button. You have to click the screen, not the forward button. Use the mouse and click the screen. We did a practice at work, there we go. <laughs> This is the way a paleontologist views the world. We'll talk about the Ice Age. Here are dinosaurs. which has direct relevance to the two talks ago. So, so what I want to do now is just tell you a story to show you the way in which climate really actually structures the biosphere. I mean, we all know that, but it's often hard to appreciate it unless you can see change in climate and a commitment change in the structure of the biosphere. And so in the last 10 or 15 million years, the whole globe has been generally cooling, despite the recent change now. And one of the consequences of this was the emergence of a stable high-pressure system in the North Pacific, 
with its concomitant airflow down here, which has the effects of creating upwelling off the California coast. And so as the wind blows down, cold water upwells against the coast here, there's San Francisco Bay, and that permanent nutrient-rich cold upwelled water led to the emergence for the first time on this coastline of the kelp forests. At the same time, the cold water meant also the loss of summer rains and the onset of strong Mediterranean uh, climate on, on land. And so within the kelp forest, a whole range of species evolved, and this is just a snapshot of many of the species that have came into existence at that time, validated by both the fossil record and molecular clock estimates between those species. And what's interesting about this is it also had major impacts on our economy as well, and in a strange way, you can actually measure the increase in the bioproductivity bio by the accumulation of diatoms that peaked at about 10 million years ago. Diatoms are these guys, extraordinarily beautiful, extraordinarily tiny, and extraordinarily important because they are, in fact, the source of the oil fields that fuel the Southern California economy. So all these oil rigs come from the diatomaceous oils. And here, for those of you who know Huntington Beach, now versus then. So that oil concentration also relates directly to that climate change that occurred at that period of time. So what I want to do now is try to give you a sense, moving now to the present, of the factors that are going to be important in terms of judging how species are going to respond to climate forcing. We are not yet, as a community, at a position to create the sort of computer models that we've just seen, but we're in the process of trying to put together the key elements. And what I want to try to do is give you a taste of what those elements look like. And so you can die, you can adapt, you can migrate, or you can do nothing, but usually that doing nothing is actually a very energetic nothing, which means adapting in some way, adjusting in some way to the change. So look at extinction first. Oh yeah, sorry, there are different approaches to use. There are historical records, computer modeling, experimental manipulation, the fossil record. And as I briefly go through these, I also want to indicate that the application of these methods often leads to brand new discoveries, which is one of the critical issues um, in trying to determine what's going to happen next. The long-term goal is to develop a general theory of biotic response to global uh, climate change. And this is a hard problem. Climate forcing, I'm not going to talk much about since we've had a lot already on that, except to say that here are those four glacial interglacial cycles. The extinction that we see during these is very low. So the organisms are simply adjusting mostly by migration as the cold and the, the, the warm went backwards and forwards. And of course, different scale, here's the CO2 increase now. So what's the difference between the climate forcing of the glacial interglacial cycles and now? So one thing that is interesting is that in red here is the perturbation projections at two times CO2 for us. And what I'd like you to note here on the diagram here is we have the magnitude of temperature change versus the rate of change. In the glacial interglacial cycles, we've seen the magnitude before as we came out of the last ice age. And briefly, we went back into a mini ice age in the Younger Dryas. We've seen the rate before. But the biosphere in the last a million and a half years has not seen the combination of both the magnitude and the rate. So there are three differences now between the experience the biota is seeing in the ice ages. We haven't seen the combination of rate and magnitude. Also, of course, now CO2 is increasing compared to now the ice ages it was dropping. So the biosphere hasn't seen the temperature. And the critical thing here, which we keep on forgetting about, is that the human pressure is much more intense. OK, so now I'm going to work through these briefly. So extinction, how severe is the current crisis? Are we in a sixth mass extinction? And I'm not going to deal as much with what controls extinction probability, because that is an especially hard problem. So in terms of mass extinction, this is a diagram of the extinction intensity over the last half billion years of the history of life. So trilobites, Cambrian explosion sitting in here, in roughly five million year bins. And what I'd like you to note is that for marine genera uh, in the oceans, that extinction is ubiquitous. But it has been punctuated by occasional giant events. We call them the big five. The two biggest are the end Permian mass extinction, where about 95% of species appear to have gone extinct. Distal cause appears to be a vast outpouring of lava in Siberia. If it 
erupted in the United States. It would cover the lower 48 states in anywhere between 300 to 1,000 feet of molten rock. So this is an enormous event. And then the meteorite hypothesis generated here at Berkeley for the extinction of the dinosaurs at the end Cretaceous. So if we look at extinction magnitude, the big five mass extinctions, when you estimate the number of species driven to extinction, are greater than 75%. And so the question is, what are the extinction magnitudes that we've experienced today? And the answer is much, much lower. So the white are things that are already extinct. The black icons represent taxa that uh, are endangered, and that's the extinction intensity if all the endangered species go extinct. So in terms of magnitude, even in the worst case scenarios, we're not close yet to a mass extinction scenario, which is fine, because 95% of all species is an awful lot. So it's not to say it's a bad thing. I'd also like you to note that almost all the extinctions that we've so far experienced have virtually nothing to do with climate change. They're almost all to do with habitat loss and human, direct human perturbation. There's a second component to extinction, and that's the rate at which things are go extinct. So here on this diagram, I have the magnitude again on the bottom, and here's the rate. These colored overlapping bands are the projected rates for the big five mass extinctions. The Cretaceous is so high because it's possible that all of those species went extinct in a bad weekend, being hit by the meteorite. It might have, though, taken 10,000, 100,000 years for the climatic effects to ramify through the biosphere, which gives you much lower rates. Based on extinctions that have already happened, the rates are already, or already at mass extinction rates. And if you take all the endangered species and drive them to extinction over 500 years, then our rates are well beyond most of the big five mass extinctions. So in terms of rates, we're looking mass extinction-like. Magnitude, no. OK. One possibility is that organisms can adapt to climate change. And we've seen a number of, in a number of talks the emphasis on the, f the rate at which the change is occurring. So there are sort of three, three time scales of evolutionary change. The first one is human time scales. They look at the cultivation of crop plants, animal stocks, the evolution of drug resistance pests. It indicates that evolution can, in fact, go very fast. It can go at human time scales. But speed is typically a function of generation time and a population size. And so I put a redwood forest in the background, as we've heard before. These guys are, have such small population sizes and long generation times, there's no chance they're going to be able to adjust to the sorts of changes that we're seeing now. Unfortunately, we don't know what aspects of biology are, are going to adapt until the selection pressure is actually applied. So we don't have a predictive model of what will change. However, with genomic data that beginning to pour in and the functional analyses that follow, we're beginning to make some progress in that link. The next stage of adaptation is what I call historical times. So it turns out as the ice sheet retreated off the North American continent, a whole bunch of freshwater rivers were formed, and marine sticklebacks invaded those rivers. Now, in the marine realm, the spines are critical to reduce predation by fish that engulf you. It turns out in freshwater streams, the primary predators are actually insect larvae that actually can grab hold of those spines. So spines are a bad thing in the river, and most riverine and lake sticklebacks do not possess these spines. Now, it turns out that we're beginning to understand some of this work done at Stanford on the genetic basis of the genetic change responsible for the loss of spines. And so it turns out there's a gene called PIDX1. Don't worry about the name. All you have to do is knock out one of the control elements, and you go from spines here to virtually none. So this looks like an easy mutation that can occur quickly. How quickly? Go to the fossil record. So here actually is a graph of the loss of actually the dorsal spines, not the ventral spines. At the base of glaciers, you sometimes get sediments in lakes, and you can get fossils out representing every year. And in a very elegant analysis, it looks like you get through about half of the morphological change in the order of 1,000 years. So that's fast geologically. It's slow on global climate change rates. Third rates adaptation on geologic timescales. This is Artipithecus, made famous last year by Tim White and his crew. And Arti is about 4.4 million years old. It's a long road from there to us. And most major changes we see in morphology and in biology go at these sorts of rates. So 
So innovation is extraordinarily slow, which means that as things go extinct, I don't expect to see in the next thousand years new species to be emerging to replace those in the same way that we saw, say, the origin of the kelp forests. OK, migration. So migration is one of the primary options open to organisms. And so if you're going to migrate where and why, it's also critically important is that this is causing a big change in the way policy operates in terms of reserves. If you think of a national park, it's not so useful if most of the species that you want can no longer tolerate the climate that's in the park. And so it's opening up, obviously, the intellectual space for creating corridors between parks or giving space for species to migrate as climate changes. And so in a spectacular study done at Berkeley is Annie Alexander and her crew, who set up the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, did a comprehensive survey of the mammals in this transect that crosses Yosemite Park. And at Berkeley, we have these outstanding natural history museums that provide us with the ground data we need to understand the way change is actually occurring. And so what happened then is Craig Moritz and his crew in the MVZ went back and resurveyed re these populations about 80 years later. And so here is just a list of 28 species of mammals. This is the altitudinal range here. The color bands show taxa that are green here that have increased the elevational range. The red one is things that have de um, left the low latitudes and become restricted into higher altitudes. So the average altitudinal change of those that change is in the order of 600 meters. It's really huge. Now, most of that's probably climate change. Of course, it could also be other biotic factors as well. So we know that things are migrating. In this case, they're going up rather than horizontally, um, talking about um, velocity of climate change. And so the question is, how can we predict what's going to happen, as opposed to simply to rely on passive historical data? And so one of the standard models that's been developed is called ecological niche modeling, where you take the geographic range of an existing species, and then you look to see what the climate envelope is that predicts that distribution. So here's a precipitation map, and then modern temperature. And so you do that for enough variables, and you develop in climate space what the realized niche space is of that species. You then go to climate reconstructions, and then you ask, where does that climate space now exist? And then you plot where the species is likely to be. So this is sort of the state of the art at present in terms of determining where species go. Now, what I'd like you to note in this case, oh, so, so here's a, some of the projections of these distribution, so here's this particular plant here, where it looks like it's likely to go extinct locally or in extreme climate models, but in this pale, pale yellow here is the new range if it's able to migrate there based on that model. So if you want to preserve this species, you've got to provide migration routes and also viable land to occupy that. Now, time for a cartoon. These models tend to exist very much in terms of uh, climate forcing, species X, and the question is, how is it going to move? And what I'm going to argue, <clears throat> as an organismic biologist and as a paleontologist, for a lot of us, there's an awful lot of biology missing. And as you start to add that biology in, your view as to what might happen will change. And so as we start putting biology in, we discover that species actually have character. And if you have character, <laughs> It turns out that probably the last thing that's going to happen is it's going to so go sedately off in the direction of the direct climate forcing. And the reason is there's a whole bunch of things that are important, biotic interactions, biotic climate feedbacks, evolutionary and genomic potential, and evolutionary history that help control what a species is going to do. And I just want to highlight just a very few of those in the, in the time I've got left. So one of the things that, of course, is intriguing about all these models predicting the future is we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So it raises this really critical scientific issue of how are we going to test our models of the ecological impacts of climate change. So one way to do that is actually to use the models to retrodict the past and then use models like ecological niche modeling to retrodict then the past distribution given the climate models and then test it with the fossil record and see what happens. And so this work has only just begun, a graduate student here at Berkeley with some colleagues elsewhere. And so here is a 
shrew sitting there. This is its current geographic range. Notice it stopped somewhere in the middle of Canada. Here is the niche modeling reconstruction of its projected range. So there's the ice sheet sitting in there. There's the expanded coastline at lower sea level than glacial. And the green here is where the species is predicted to be using these models at the glacial maximum about 21,000 years ago. The dark lines are an alternative approach prediction. And then in the fossil record, we're lucky to have a fairly rich fossil record in eastern North America. There's where the fossils are. Prediction's not very good, presumably because of biotic interaction, which is trumping the simple climate envelope forcing. So I think we have a lot of work to do yet to understand how species are going to behave. So one can't treat species individualistic part uh, particles and so really the question is how are our ecosystems going to respond, or the, uh, taking into account the interactions between species? And what do we mean by an ecosystem in the first place? Now a lot of us get talk about the delicate balance of nature and how species have all co-evolved together to form coherent ecosystems. It turns out this view is partially true and it's partially untrue, and I'll explain the, uh, show you the data why it's probably untrue. So here are four maps of eastern United States again. So here's the ice extent at about 14,000 years ago. Here's the present. Each of the colors represents a different forest type. And it turns out by the time you go back to the glacial extent here, the red here represents a forest type that is simply not present today. There's no analog of it whatsoever. So here we have an ephemeral community that quite quickly disappeared is no longer with us. So association of species can come and go, which means that species that depend, say, on a couple of tree species have not been doing so for particularly long. So now I want to just give you a couple of examples of the importance of biotic effects. This is work from Mary Power, also in integrated biology at Berkeley. And this is a case where now experimental manipulation, what they've done is they've taken a series of plots here in the lower Sierra and simply added 20% increased spring rainfall for some plots and others and asked what's happened. So there are three types of plants involved here. There are wildflowers that can fix nitrogen. There are grasses and there are wildflowers that don't fix nitrogen. Apologies for the botanist for the crass representation of the forbs. What happens with the wildflowers that fix nitrogen? Initially, their numbers go up with the increased rain. It's fine. What happens then is that these guys, because they fix nitrogen, fuel the growth of the grasses. The grasses go berserk with the rain and the nitrogen, and they choke out the wildflowers. So if you're only going to predict what's going to happen, you need to know about these sorts of interactions. Second example is, why did the California condor survive the Ice Age megafaunal extinction? Fossil condors have been found in Texas and in Florida. They fed off the carcasses of large mammals, camels, horse, that were ex ex uh, are now extinct. And so the question is, why did they survive um, the extinction of the megafauna, their food source? You can go to the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. You can take isotopic measurements out of their bones and work out what they were eating. And it turns out at the La Brea tar pits, some of the condors were feeding some of the time on whale and seal carcasses right on the ocean edge here. And so they're able to escape the extinction of the megafauna by switching food sources. So there's a case where a climate model isn't going to even vaguely guess the distribution of these guys now. And that fossil work led to different strategies of conservation biology, which is why don't we introduce these guys up on the central California coast where these things still beach. OK, so we've talked about climate ecosystem feedbacks, but Sometimes it can go the other way. The ecosystems can have an impact on the climate. And this now in modern generation models is being incorporated. I just want to indicate two examples of this. When people started to try to model the rate of retreat of the glacial ice sheet at the end of the last ice age, the predictions turned out to be too slow. The model they were using was assuming that as the ice retreats, it leaves behind it rock. And rock reflects light better than trees. If you assume that what was happening is that as the ice was retreating, that spruce trees were growing right up against it and following it north, spruce trees are dark. Oops. 
spruce trees are dark, so they absorb more energy, and so accelerate the rate of, of melting of the ice sheet. And so it turns out, again, we go to the fossil record, and here, for based on fossil pollen, is the distribution of spruce trees. And so you can see, as the ice sheet was retreating, they're growing right up hard against the ice sheet, accelerating the rate of melt. So the forcing goes in the other direction as well. It's not just climate on ecosystems. Second example coming from John Hart's tremendous work of setting up heaters going 24-7, 365 days a year. So here's a melted snow patch in the Colorado. It turns out what happens is that as the experiment proceeds, you replace the forbs with sagebrush. Sagebrush is darker. That absorbs more sunlight. And that has the effect equivalently of locally increasing summer temperature climates that's equivalent to two times CO2 forcing. So again, reflectivity vegetation cover is critically important to exactly what's going to happen locally. And everybody knows you plant a forest, you increase rainfall, you uh, ameliorate temperature. So take home messages. We are in the discovery phase of determining the factors and feedbacks that will determine the fate of species and ecosystems during climate change. We're reaching into our bag of tricks. The feedbacks operate over many temporal scales in between the phenotype, the genotype, evolutionary history, geography, and climate itself. And so one of the challenges is trying to get all these communities to meet together to work on this problem. And so what's been happening at Berkeley, uh, initiated by Graham Fleming, is an initiative of global change biology, which is drawing together the ecologists, museum people, the paleontologists, the natural historians, people from um, uh, environmental science, policy, and management, to focus where we have specific knowledge and detailed knowledge and expertise, the Sierra Nevada, Central Coast, and tropical islands, to see if we can develop a general theoretical framework for understanding how all these factors will translate into a meaningful prediction of the way ecosystems will change. And some of the key people on this also contributed enormously to the content of this talk. And here's a, a, a bunch of them here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. So now we'd like to move into the audience participation phase of, of the morning. We'll have about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll break for lunch. Um, don't actually have any cards with questions on them, so let me just ask, do we? Well, I'm going to cheat and ask a question first. Um, and I don't know, how, how are we going to, uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so maybe the speakers could at least uh, come up here so that they're facing the audience. Um, ah, here we go. Great. Okay, here's a tough one right away for Bill Collins. <laughs> how well do computer models fit the ice core record um, from, say, 10,000 to 100,000 years ago. Is this explained by Milankovitch cycles? So, is it on, is it on now? Good. Yes, it is on. The, um, we've not had an opportunity to run common models continuously over a Milankovitch cycle for 100,000 years. We have tested the models for the last 20,000 years. Try this one. Good. OK, now you can hear me. We have run climate models for the last 20,000 years uh, since the last major glaciation. And um, with some minor course corrections, the, the, the model that we've tried this with, so a continuous 20,000-year simulation, does a remarkably good job of simulating the climate record since the last major glaciation. We have not yet had an opportunity to test a model over a 100,000 year time span. So to re reproduce one of those major cycles that you saw in Ralph's talk this morning. We've tested it in sort of snapshot mode. Um, sure, when you subject it to an orbital change, the northern hemisphere gets hotter. You see the appropriate changes in uh, plant life distribution. That's not really, I think, a, a concrete test. We need to do a continuous test with a carbon cycle to see if we're actually going to reproduce the historical record, and we've not done that yet. 
Thank you. Uh, another question, this one I think for Chris. Are there any historic data showing energy use per capita? Uh, this would presumably help differentiate whether CO2 emission increase in the future is mainly going to be due to higher living standards or more population. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And uh, basically, the historical message is that we haven't figured out a way to make societies rich without also increasing emissions of carbon, essentially in concert. Uh, you can look either historically uh, for any individual country, or you can look across uh, levels of economic activity within the world today over more or less a factor of 100 for carbon emissions and 100 for per capita GDP. And pretty much on a log log plot, all the countries in the world through the last century fall on the same line. There's some, you know, log log plots are good at, at hiding differences, and there are some important differences among countries, but the key message from the past has been that moving to a higher per capita GDP required also moving to higher carbon emissions. And if the message from this morning's talks is that we need to find a way to, to decrease carbon emissions and the emissions of other greenhouse gases, what we basically need to do is, is find a way to break that relationship and move to higher GDPs at the same time we move toward lower carbon emissions. Uh, history doesn't show us the way to do that. I think it's the technologies we're going to see over the next couple of days that are going to show us the way to do that. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to ask one question, and then I'll open the floor to a couple more. Uh, so here's a question I'd like to have asked, uh, answered first by Chris and then by Charles. And that is, can we put a value on the, in other words, a cost on the climate change impacts? It seems we've talked about the effects on productivity and economics. But in fact, presumably, if climate changes, we're going to be paying a very high cost. But can we value that? So, so we're really good at putting economic values on some kinds of things, on uh, whether we sell as many cars this year as last year. And we're much worse at putting values on other kinds of things. That includes the services we get from ecosystems when they provide clean air, clean water. And then there are other kinds of things that we're really uh, hopeless at, and that's things like the value of biological diversity. The, what I think is that um, we're, we're seeing progress in quantifying some of the ecosystem service type um, quantities, um, things like water purification, carbon stabilization. But the, the, the way I see a sort of a useful framework moving forward is that is that I'd like each individual to sort of think about um, values that, that, they can, that they can set their own exchange rates on. So, I mean, it, it seems to me that, that what each of us ought to be doing is saying, how, how do I personally value uh, biodiversity moving into the future? How do I personally value um, ecosystem services? And to, 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 to then think about th how those exchange rates translate into the requirements for a sustainable future. Uh, I, I'm confident that once people kind of embrace the challenge of doing them, that themselves, they'll come up with smart approaches. I agree. <laughs> I say one thing which I think is important too to recognize is that, I mean, there are some genuine infrastructural costs, which is if climate belts really move, then optimal growing places move. And so you, you know, you can't move dams, but you might have to move your fields and your supply routes to them. So that's a critical issue, I think. Um, and there was one other point, and it's gone out the window. Yeah, the other issue is something called Schmelhausen's principle, which is really important, I think, in biology, which is as species get to the edge of their physiological tolerances, they tend to be less tolerant to all types of perturbation. So if you're healthy and wealthy and you lose your job or you change job, it's not a problem. If you're on the bread line and you don't make it to work for a day, you get fired and you lose your house and your kids and everything else. So one thing that's critically important is that particularly species that can't move or are outside their tolerance as temperature goes up, their susceptibility to perturbation is going to go up. And some of those species might involve our critical species like crop plants, et cetera. So that there is that aspect also that's not really built into the ecological models to some degree yet. OK, thank you. So I have one more question here. And it actually was directed to Chris, but I, I actually want to change it and direct it to Ralph, if it's OK. Uh, <laughs> so 
This question, I'm going to change it a little bit. It says, uh, the question is, climate measurements have been done actually in very few places on Earth. Consequently, then, how can we be so sure of the conclusions? And I would sort of extend that to say, what science or research or measurements or monitoring really needs to be done still to document the uh, climate changes? Well, that's a, that's a fair point. The, the density of measurements that's needed to give the answers that everyone wants is probably larger than we'll ever obtain. I'll give one example, though, where things have been done very thoughtfully. Uh, in the mid-80s, I think 1986, Jim Hansen and a scientist named Lebedev tried to calculate from empirically how close together measurements had to be made to, Inez, you were there, uh, to, to see whether temperature measurements on the surface were redundant or not. And they looked at uh, ob objective data and found that in an east-west direction, the correlation length, uh, there were very, very high correlations with temperatures averaged over, I think, a two, three week period for about 1,500 kilometers, something like that. Hmm. How much? For over what period of time? No, 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 but they, these were monthly measurements too. At any rate, there are empirical ways to try to determine whether or not the sampling uh, spatial separation is small enough, and it's been done reasonably well on surface temperatures, but some of these other variables, for example, the ocean temperature data I showed this morning, uh, well over half of each of these papers goes into addressing the shortcomings in the data and the sampling so that you have a feeling that there isn't enough sampling yet on ocean temperatures. The remote sensing capabilities, though, really are, are elevating the, uh, the quality of these data sets, at least the ones I showed this morning, like the uh, ice measurements and the sea level measurements, where now we're really getting proper global averages. And yet, as uh, one of you said, the action is really local. I think it was Bill, I think, said that we have to get capabilities down to a local level, which means that uh, on short time scales, there will be a much, much higher need for high density measurements to, to pin down the, the local uh, uh, fields of variance and trends. So that's about as well as I can do, Don. I'm going to ask one more question of Chris. Um, so uh, I've been trying to understand better the carbon cycle myself, and it seems to me that one of the things that we've uh, gotten for free over the last hundred years is that the ocean, and not only the ocean, but the land biota take up some of the carbon that we've been putting in the atmosphere. Now, what I've, what I've also seen is that as, as you project this out to the future, people are pretty confident about what the ocean is going to do for the next few hundred years, but there's very large uncertainty about what the land's going to do and whether or not, in fact, it's going to continue to take up this carbon. Is, uh, do you have a view on, on the likelihood that the land biota is going to continue to bail us out? Well, that, that's one of the specific goals of the modeling framework that Bill already told you about. And I think that what we can say is that we've had a tremendous ecosystem service that's been provided by land ecosystems. In recent decades, we've seen something like three billion tons of carbon per year taken up by ecosystems on land. Some combination of regrowth of previously harvested forests, uh, CO2 fertilization, and direct human uh, changes in things like agricultural practices. What we don't know for the future is um, how climate change will alter some important features of the land system, um, whether there will be droughts that cause large-scale increases in disturbance rates. Uh, many of the si climate model simulations indicate that we don't need very much drying in the future in order to convert much of what's currently Amazon rainforest into Amazon savanna with loss of, of many hundreds of billions of tons of carbon. Uh, we also don't know how humans are going to interact with the land surface. You know, there's uh, one group of scientists who say that the, uh, we're likely to see a big increase in tree growth in the Amazon as a consequence of CO2 fertilization. Others say a small 
increase in drought could lead to forests that have previously been inflammable being subject to forest fire and conversion to savanna. And a third group who've been looking at human action say that uh, based on the trends that we know about, it doesn't really matter which of those happen because the forest is going to be cut down by the time these climate changes kick in in a major way anyhow. I think that we, we have a bunch of pieces of the, of the models together, but we need to recognize a, a point that I think all three of us recognize is that we're not living in a world where these pure ecological processes play out um, with only them as the controllers, that the human factors are also exceedingly important in the way even the big parts of these Earth system components respond. Thank you. Um, this afternoon, I would like to uh, talk about uh, carbon capture and uh, sequestration. Um, well, we, it has already been mentioned. Uh, the, the question was, what about geoengineering? Uh, this is a typical uh, geoengineering experiment before the name was even invented, since we decided to, to put a large amount of uh, carbon in the atmosphere that nature has sequestered over many, many million years of time. And uh, the question is, given these enormous emissions in uh, CO2, is there something uh, we can do? And it has already been mentioned before. And what we can actually do is it's called carbon capture and sequestration. So what you see here is uh, geological formations. Here is some human activity. And um, the interesting thing is that carbon capture and sequestration is actually a, a very proven technology because we have been doing it uh, for many, many years. And here, for example, you see a pipeline this pipeline, and the red lines here are CO2, this pipeline is pum pumping CO2 in an oil field, and the CO2 in the oil field is decreasing the viscosity, so you can explore more oil. So you see the, the mechanism of uh, displacing CO2 from large distances, putting it into the ground, and uh, as, a, as a way of enhancing oil recovery, it's called enhanced oil recovery, and when I was working at Shell, they stopped the research on this because they would think an oil price above $45 per barrel would be complete nonsense. <laughs> the interesting thing is that the entire research was focused on using as little CO2 as possible. Um, the reason was that the CO2 didn't come from this power plant, but actually came from CO2 reservoirs in the, in the, uh, in the Earth. So in Texas, there are many fields which actually pump up CO2 through the pipelines to put it in other reservoirs, but with the aim is to minimize the losses of CO2. Uh, what we would like to do now is actually uh, maximize the losses of CO2 and in such a way that, that the CO2 can actually store, be stored uh, in these different types of geological formations. Um, well, if you give such a presentation in Berkeley, one of the first questions you have to address is they show you a piece of coal and say, well, uh, this coal is sort of the perfect way of sequestering CO2. So why do you go to the effort of burning the CO2, capturing the CO2 to put it back in the ground? Why don't you just leave it there? Well, um, that seems to be a, a perfectly sensible solution. And we have seen the, these many, many graphs before, and you can uh, find many of them. And in order to keep up with the increase of energy use, there are efficiency, renewables, nuclear, coal to gas, but the, a, a large component is this carbon capture and sequestration. And hopefully, people get inspired, in, inspired by this uh, presentation to work a little bit harder that maybe these type of uh, employments are not necessary. But in most of the realistic scenarios, what we have seen so far, we continue and actually much more uh, scary to use uh, fossil fuels. So it's better to have such a technique available. Um, and, and this is really uh, one of the, the single biggest item here which can help at uh, reducing the emissions. Um, another thing uh, which is an exciting idea, let's try to do something useful with CO2. And useful is very, you, you take a molecule of CO2 and you connect it to another molecule. We haven't developed the chemistry yet, we're probably going to ask Graham for some additional funding to do so, but we have already uh, invented a name, that new molecule is Dreamium, and we have found some applications of Dreamium. So, but what I want you is just think about the consequences of making Dreamium. 
just taking a CO2 molecule and connected it to another molecule and call it dreamium. So what, what I've done here is, uh, here is a list of the top 50 chemicals being produced. And we're going to develop this chemistry to use all of those single molecules here that are being produced to make dreamium. This is the global production of those, those molecules. And here is the total amount in megatons per year. And this is the total amount of sort of CO2 that's being emitted. So if you make dreamium, you will deplete the top 50% of all the chemicals being produced for making this dreamium molecule. And then you can actually capture only a fraction of the total amount of CO2. And by the same consequence, you will uh, completely uh, overwhelm any market. There is no material you want to use at such a large scale, even if it's called dreamium. So, so this is a bit the issue. Huh? We're going to burn coals, and we cannot convert the CO2 uh, into something useful. So the only practical solution to get rid of such a huge amount of material is, to, is this geological uh, sequestration. And, and that is also what Don Pablo mentioned. Uh, here are reservoirs which are identified um, where there is space. So in the Earth, there is sufficient amount of space that we can store the total amount of CO2 that is actually being produced. So the technical solution is there. We can separate the CO2. We can sequester the CO2. However, we do not know what the consequences are of injecting such an enormous amount of CO2. And what I will show later on is the cost of uh, capturing the CO2 is actually quite, quite large. Well, uh, these are uh, test uh, sites where already some form of carbon capture or sequestration is, is done. So there, there is already this experience, so, so we're working on there. But what, what I will, will actually show, there are some issues which sort of justify the research we're doing here in Berkeley. So this is the idea. You have this uh, power plant. You separate the CO2. You need to separate because you want to, to, to make uh, supercritical CO2 that has a lower density than gas CO2, and therefore you need to get rid of the, the nitrogen. And you do the storage. Uh, in Berkeley, we have two so-called energy frontier research centers. And th those, the missions of these centers is to, 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 to do basic science that supports these ideas. So in the geological stories, you basically you would like to guarantee people that we put this CO2 down here, that it will stay there for many thousand years on time. And reducing the uncertainties um, associated with putting the CO2 in these geological formations is sort of the main uh, trust of uh, Don de Pablo's uh, EFRC. Where we are working on in the captures EFRC is addressing the expensive part of uh, carbon capture and sequestration. So uh, just to, to, to go uh, back to these, these risks, this is a plot where you have the number of years uh, since injection, and here this is the trapping um, contribution. So if you inject the CO2, it first will be sealed by the rock. That is called uh, structural uh, trapping. It will slowly, it will then can dissolve, and eventually it will become a mineral. Now, if it's a mineral, let's say limestone, this is definitely certain. So you, would, you see that this is going on very large time scales. But what you also <laughs> see is the longer the CO2 stays, it, it, it goes into uh, modes of, of trapping which are much more certain. So what you see is the increased uh, storage capacity. And within uh, the EFRC of DOM, you try to identify what are the main sources of leakage. How can you make sure that you go as quickly as possible to these uh, more secure uh, trapping mechanisms? Uh, the, I mentioned the cost. These are the sort of the breakdown of the cost. This is the capture part, which is in 25 uh, euros per ton CO2, the sort of uh, guesstimated cost, hopeful cost. This is the uh, transport part, and here we have the storage part. And, and what you see is the storage of, is, is, is an order of magnitude and transport smaller than the capture part. Uh, as, as, as I sort of mentioned, in, in the storage parts is basically the, the uncertainties we have to deal with. So why are the costs so high? And that is uh, illustrated uh, with this uh, picture. So here, there is a, a power plant. It's sort of located here. It has CO2 and nitrogen. Well, this is a known technology. This type of technology has been developed in 1930. 
So what is here is, is a column with water and amine solution. What you then do is you bubble the CO2 through it. It captures this, the, the, C, the, the nitrogen and the CO2, the flue gas. It captures the CO2 with those amines and uh, you get pure nitrogen out. What you then need to do is you need to regenerate this solution, get saturated with CO2 that is then uh, occurring in these kind of towers. And what you do, and that is actually the problem, these amine solutions are very efficient in capturing CO2, so you need quite some energy to release the CO2 again. The other problem is that amine solutions contain as much as 70% of water, and in order to release the CO2, you need to boil this with steam coming from the power plant. This steam you cannot any more efficiently convert into electricity, so you get a power loss of, of, of inefficiently of about 30%. So what that means is if you, you can do this, but the efficiency of your power plant will be dropping by 30%. So you need to, to have 30% more coal to implement this type of process. So, and, and that is sort of, uh, you can do it, but it's expensive. Um, this is another interesting plot. This is coming from a report of McKinsey, and there are a few things which are very important to mention. So here are the stages of technology. This is commercial, this is pre-commercial, this is in demonstration, this is in testing. And in this industry, this is a time scale which is top typically 20 to 30 years, which you have because, because of the inertia which was mentioned uh, this morning. Um, if you would look at a similar plot for, say, biotechnology, you would have many concepts and many new ideas and nothing that's working. Here we have the inverse. All the things are working, they are practically employ employed, but there are no ideas. And, and the reason is actually very simple, and, and that is that uh, CO2 hasn't been seen as scientifically a very attractive molecule. So nobody in his, sci his right scientific mind would actually start working on CO2. You see, uh, within Shell, when I was working there, it was actually the, the aim of the research was to minimize the CO2 losses, where well, now you would maximize. So you can see the way those reservoir simulators are built, they are aimed at minimizing losing, losses, not in maximizing the amount of CO2 that's staying there. So what you see, uh, so the aims of the EFRCs, which John and, and I are heading, is creating options, new options for, for here. The other thing is what we see, it, within this industry, it's typical to come from here to there in 20 to 30 years. Um, but we also have seen that the climate may not wait for that cycle. So one of the concerns is how can we go as quickly as possible to from new ideas uh, to here, and, and this is something we, uh, we will try to do within this EOFAC, and I will come back to it, but Arun Ajundar will probably mention this problem uh, very much, and RPI-E is actually aimed of, of going quickly from here to there. Okay, um, why is CO2, from a scientific point of view, actually very interesting, and the separating of CO2? Here we have the mixture of flue gases, mainly nitrogen. This is a coal-fired power plant, so it has about 13% CO2, water, oxygen, SO2, and here I've uh, drawn the molecular diameter, so the diameter of the, the molecules. And what you see, they're all very similar. And that makes it, because the molecules are so similar, makes it so difficult to separate. In other words, we, we need a very subtle chemistry to take advantage of these subtle differences. And, and that is actually what we try to do within the EFRC. Can we make uh, new classes of molecules, of materials, and this is a the type of materials we, for example, we consider, metal organic framework, where we basically use the techniques we have developed over the last years to put every single molecule at the right place to separate CO2. And um, the people that are doing that are sort of shown here. These are making metal organic frameworks, these are making membranes, these are busy with the characterization, and those are trying to make computational uh, predictions. So, um, the gas separations we actually considering, well this we mentioned is flue gases, and other separations which is actually important is in natural gas. Some natural gas fields may contain as much as 70% CO2, so what you want to get the methane out and put the CO2 back. 
Another one, which may actually become very important in, because of reasons of overshoots, which we have seen uh, today, is to try to, to actively reduce CO2 levels from, uh, directly from the atmosphere. So what you see here, here you have a flue gas at the end of a pipe, what you're calling in engineering. So you don't have pressure as a driving force. So you would make a slightly different way of separating here than here for natural gas, where you have high pressure and high temperatures. Here, you have something specific, which is an extremely low concentration of CO2. So if you just look at basic thermodynamics, the entropy of mixing at very low concentrations is actually very expensive. So if you don't capture it here, you can capture it here, but the price will be five times higher. And the other thing is there are different ways of um, running uh, fire, uh, coal-fired power plants, and you can also burn it directly with oxygen, and that makes an oxygen separation important and not so uh, CO2. So where we concentrate on in our EFSC are making novel solid adsorbents and novel membranes, and they're focused on these type of separations. But what I will do this in, in time, I will just discuss this one. Well, and the type of materials that we're looking at are called so-called metal organic framework. And this is their crystals. And what you see here is a beautiful picture of how they look like if you put it in a computer. So what you have here is a metal, you have a linker, and they form this framework. Um, these materials, they, they hold the world record of surface. So basically, you only need a little bit of material to have a soccer field of surface, which makes them ideal for gas separations. Um, you can vary the linker, you can vary the metal, you can vary the structure. It, it, it's almost like a, a polymer. It's a class of material the class of material which you can make many, many different types of changes. And what we would like to do is to control these changes and get the optimum for a gas separation. So the question is, what is then this optimum? So here we have our material. Suppose we have the ideal material. You have the mixture of CO2 and N2. It goes there and you get pure nitrogen out. So this is what you could call an absorption process. So here we have loading, here we have pressure, and this is the uptake as a function of pressure of CO2, and here we have nitrogen. So if we operate at these conditions, there is a high loading of CO2, there's no nitrogen uh, upload. So here, if we are at these conditions, the material will absorb the CO2 and let the NO2, uh, N2 go through. So when, when this is saturated, you, you, you get a breakthrough of CO2, and then you need to regenerate. So what the regeneration actually involves is you heat, for example, your material, and then the absorption curve looks like this. So at this pressure, you basically see it's desorbing, so we get pure CO2 out. So this is then the idea. And the energy is going in the increase of going, the energy needed to heat your, your system from here to there. Then the question is, if we have the flexibility of making these materials, in A mines, we need to use steam to do this, but can we, for example, use low-grade heat, which is sometimes available in a power plant to reduce these energy costs? Well, if you want to do that, then you basically need to be able to tune your materials in such a way that you have the adsorption isotherms at exactly the place where the en engineers would like to have them to use this low-quality heat, and maybe you are able to reduce this energy, uh, parasitic energy loss from a power plant <coughs> to very acceptable levels. Of course, that is sort of the dream we have, and usually with those dreams you only get halfway, but now it's 40%, so if we can reduce this with these ideas to 15%, we're probably already quite far. So the idea is, can we control the chemistry in such a way that we can fine-tune materials to exactly the needs of engineers that design these or retrofit these power plants? So this is an example of the, the research we are, we are then doing. So here you have uh, another form of the metal organic framework, and what you can do is you can develop the chemistry to, Im to make the same material with magnesium, cobalt, nickel, or zinc. And you see you get an enormous tunability of these uh, adsorption isotherms. Um, they have robots to make these type of materials, and it typically takes a few weeks to a few months to, to make one of those materials. But you see you have this, this tunability. Um, if you then think about this, what, what can the gamers do? They can change the metal, they can change the linker, and these are linkers that are sort of opted in the literature, and they can change the pore topology. 
Well, if you think about this, 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 this is a lot. This is enormous, and this is even more enormous. So if you multiply this, you get many, you get many, many million different of structures that you can synthesize. So which one would be then the best one to synthesize? What we then try to do is use computational techniques to see whether these type of materials are much more selective. So you see an example here, which is just a selection of two. Here we have, uh, uh, these are zips, this sort of um, metal organic framework where you can put a chlorine or not, and then you can do computational techniques to uh, predict the selectivity. So uh, here we predict the selectivities of those two materials, and you see the one with chlorine for both CO2 uh, methane separations or CO2 nitrogen separation is giving a higher selectivity. So you can make those predictions. And then we can sort of say, well, this is with one type of material. Why we don't, don't we look at the effect of the pore topologies? So what we see is we calculate the selectivities of all those pore topologies, and we find one that is really excellent. But many of our guesses actually are not that great, and we try to be intelligent. If you think about this, it takes about one to two weeks to calculate one point, which is less than the experimental people, but it's still very far. If you think about the number of structures that can be made, there are many, many millions. So this is also, from a computational point of view, a very difficult uh, task. So what we do there, and uh, we use the uh, collaboration with the computer science department at LBNL, and they have implemented an algorithm which is actually developed in Stanford. On, it's, it's biological inspired, as you can see, and it's about uh, running elephants. So here you have an elephant that is running, and here there is an elephant standing. Yep, it has something to do with structures. Okay, so if I give you a picture of an elephant that is running, you can immediately take out ah, this is a running elephant, and this one is standing still. But teaching that algorithm to a computer is actually very difficult. So what they done in Stanford is they analyzed the topology of such object and such an object, and here you see these graphs. And then they make a graph of a third picture, and then they identify this is more similar to a running elephant or a standing still. And in that way, you can recognize a object and see whether it's similar to this or that one. You can do that with heads or with horses. So what we have done is we actually looked at these porous structures and made those graphs and then say, OK, can we have a structure that is similar to the ones that were very successful? And this screening takes a fraction of a second, so you can go through a millions of structures to identify which ones are very uh, successful. And, and this way, uh, we get some more on site. So what I sort of have shown you so far are basically the, the scientific uh, endeavors we're doing. So we're trying to develop computational methodologies, analytical techniques, also uh, synthetic techniques, to actually get some ideas on materials and how to make them. Uh, what we don't do with this EFRC is actually do something useful. And the reason is we are in the science domain. So recently we also got an ARPA-E grant, uh, which allows us to take of the most fascinating materials, which really look successful, and not only test this ideal nitrogen uh, CO2 mixture, but also look at the effects of sulfur and other compounds which you have in flue gases. This is, from a scientific point of view, uh, maybe not that important, but it's actually crucial that we take those into account because in the application that can be a showstopper. So within uh, the support we get from ARPA-E, we, we, we can develop these um, high throughput uh, techniques where we make the materials in a very large scale, but also test them in a high throughput mode and see whether they, they, they're efficient and we can test them for many more gases. What we also will do there, and that is an, sort of an interesting question, if you have so many materials, it's far too many to um, to consider. And an important question for practical application is what would be the cost of the material? Well, if you look at the current um, metal organic frameworks, there isn't enough money in the world to actually buy enough for carbon capture because it's a specialty chemical. However, within these classes of materials, you can make many, many millions of them. You would like to select a route which you can scale up to this gigaton scale. And that is done in the EETD division where we make this life cycle analysis and try to predict um, whether it's possible to, to selectively search for those materials that you can actually reasonably cheaply make. Okay, with this, I would like to thank you for the, your attention and leave you with a quote of Chief Shu, which is actually saying that 
the climate problem uh, requires fierce urgency on carbon capture and sequestration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Berend. So the final talk of the environment session will be by Professor Inez Fung. And she will be talking about the subject of monitoring, verifying, and attributing CO2 emissions. We've heard a lot this morning about um, CO2 and climate change. And we've heard from Chris Field about climate treaties, about um, minimizing emission uh, and aspirational targets we are all familiar with. What has been um, our concern is how do we know we've done something? This is um, a, a figure of the greenhouse gases, and I don't need to spend too much time here, that the major greenhouse gas is CO2 from fossil fuel emission, and that's about 56 57, 60% of the climate forcing for the gases covered by the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change. If we include the short-lived the short -lived gases, uh, it's a different picture, but the UN uh, Framework Convention for Climate Change is focusing on CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and the CFCs. So our concern is if we reduce CO2 emission, how do we know? So first, how do we know how much we've been how much we've been estimating. You've seen a lot of figures. And so from the UN, um, from the UN a national, uh, uh, a questionnaire is sent out to a country and says, please fill out this questionnaire. Okay, so how each country fills out the questionnaires depends on the capability of the countries, the intention of the countries, and about two thirds of African countries do not report. So what is estimated is, the anthropogenic, what is asked for is the anthropogenic emissions and removals, and most and all countries base it on socioeconomic statistics, and they fill out the questionnaire. So the verification in this case is did you fill out the right questionnaire? Not whether you put in the nobody comes and checks the numbers. So the from the UN statistics, what we can see is that. One quarter of the countries are responsible for 80% of the emission. The bars are for the individual countries. And I'm trying to figure out which end this thing. The bars are for the individual countries. And you see this is 2006. So this is US peaks here for all the, all the greenhouse gases, the UN Framework Convention gases, and here's the cumulative emission. Um, so we have to focus not, you know, even though I said two thirds of African countries do not report, we focus on the large emitters. So for the US, what we have been able to do is actually cross check the statistics. So the two ways of estimating emissions one is knowing how much fuel from the mass of fuel. This is a coal train uh, going to a particular coal, the power plant. And so we can calculate from the mass of fuel how much, what is the caloric content of the coal and how much CO2 would come out uh, from, the, from the combustion of the coal. The other is to measure directly at the, at the stack. And these at the places that, that where both things happen agree to about 3%. So the way we do it for the Department of Energy, um, we focus on the inventory of fuel so that for the fuel weight, whether it is oil, gas, or coal, the fuel weight, and then there's an emission factor depending on what the coal is, how it is burned, etc. The EPA does the inventory by consumption. Um, and so we know the steel production or the, or the miles traveled by automobiles, and then we have a multiplication of the emission factor. So the fact that they agree uh, is quite remarkable. But these do not cover the same thing. So EPA, for example, does not include bunker fuel. So when you take a, an American carrier from Frankfurt to San Francisco, that is not counted by the EPA. 
So when we add up all the country for the whole globe, when we add up all the country emissions, they don't add up to the global emission. Um, so when you talk about 3%, um, it may be nothing to think of, not worry about, but when you put a dollar figure per ton of CO2, 3% comes out to a large number of dollars. So for the US, then this is the, from the EPA for 2006, the, they report it in terms of, this just shifted, uh, so this is coal, coal is black, uh, this is petroleum and gas, so the, the electricity generation is the largest, obviously, coal, and then the second is transportation. This is very important for verification. If I turn out my lights, nothing, the CO2 around here isn't going to do anything. Uh, the CO2, it will be the coal from, in some, probably in Wyoming or some other place that is providing the electricity. And so in terms of verification, then we have to keep track of not just the coal, the power plants, uh, but also the different sectors. So what would show up, the chancellor has, uh, UC Berkeley has its own emission reduction target, uh, six, seven years ahead of the state. And so what would show up around Berkeley would be the change in, in transportation, would be changed bicycling, fewer, fewer uh, less driving, etc. So the challenge is, when we put in an S, what I call an aspirational goal, we will reduce the CO2 emission of, by a certain date, we will reduce by so many percent of the emission that we did in 1990. Number one, how do we know what we did in 1990? Uh, number two, uh, how do we know we actually achieve the goal that we have, we, we aspire to? So, Crucial point here is trust but verify. So speed limits are not very helpful uh, unless they're radar detectors, unless they're police out there. Um, uh, volunteer, um, volunteer reduction uh, is very nice, but we cannot do anything about it. So what we have been doing is to use the atmospheric CO2 concentration and say, how can we use that to figure out where the emission is coming from? From Ralph Cicerone's talk this morning, Ralph pointed out that the 57% of the fossil fuel emission globally has remained in the atmosphere. And he showed you the figure between the, the, the Dave Keeling's CO2 record at Mauna Loa and at the South Pole. If we go back to that figure, what we also see, what I see, is that the difference between the hemispheres between Mauna Loa and South Pole has been, the two curves are slowly departing because 96% of the fossil fuel emission is in the northern hemisphere, while the atmosphere Mauna Loa registers the global average. Um, it is, there's a slight delay in the transport, in the mixing between the hemispheres, and we see the difference between the hemispheres. So when we use the atmospheric CO2 pattern, the idea is that if we have two sampling sites, and here we're pumping CO2 in the atmosphere, the site that is downwind of the emission will have higher CO2 than the one that is upwind. And so we use the variation in the pattern to figure out where the sources are. So this is like looking at the footprint of the dragon to figure out what the dragon is about. So what we're talking about here is the, what we call tracer transport inversion. So we use the variation in CO2 in the atmosphere and say where does the CO2 came from and where does it go? And to do that, we need to know where, the, where the, the wind, how the wind is going, how the clouds are mixing, how tracers and other pollutants in the atmosphere, and how the atmosphere works. The sampling network um, that we have now is fairly sparse. Mauna Loa is here. And what we have are stations where Ralph talked about is continuous. The US has four stations, Point Barrow, Alaska, Mauna Loa, Samoa, and South Pole, where they are the staff year-round, and so the CO2 that's sucked in from the atmosphere, and you get hourly CO2 that's continuous, continuous monitoring. 
The other method is flask monitoring. So a flask about this big is sent out to a, to a collaborative site. And so somebody goes out, when the wind blows from the right direction, go out and release the valve and the, it's evacuated flask. So CO2 is, goes into the flask and the flask is shipped back to NOAA in Boulder, Colorado for analysis. So we get about two samples, duplicate samples every other week. So about 100 sites. So we have about 100 observations every other week. And these sites are deliberately situated in remote marine atmosphere because the CO2, as you saw at Mauna Loa, there's a, there's a, there's a little, what we call noise or contamination from the terrestrial system, from land plants, from fossil fuel, so that this is seeing the mixing of the whole atmosphere. We see the whole global atmospheric CO2 increase. So now what we, when we do verification, what was noise in this system becomes the signal that we're after. So in this system, from this set of network, we see what we call, we see the flying carpet of CO2. So this is CO2 concentration. This is North Pole to South Pole, and this is time. So you can see very clearly that the increase in CO2 with time that you have seen in the, in the plots that Ralph showed this, this morning. But what you also see is that the northern hemisphere is higher CO2 than the southern hemisphere. And so this is, as I said, 96% of the fossil fuel emission is in the north, and the mixing time is about one year between the hemispheres. And what you see very clearly is the terrestrial system photosynthesis, northern hemisphere photosynthesis, removing CO2 from the atmosphere, decomposition, returning CO2 to the atmosphere. And we see a very clear um, north, uh, diurnal cycle and the, the, the seasonal cycle, sorry, seasonal cycle here, and the southern hemisphere seasonal cycle six months out of phase with that in the north. So the north-south gradient is about 1%. You know, we're now 390 parts per million. The north-south gradient is about 1% of the, of the global average. The mixing time, as I said, between hemispheres is about one year, but the mixing time around a latitude circle, east-west, is about two weeks. So given the signal we're talking about, the network is absolutely inadequate for telling the difference for, between North American emission, European emission, or Asian emission. So what do we do? What we want to do is to deploy a CO2 sensing satellite. So instead of having, having CO2 concentrations at remote locations once every other week, um, we want a CO2 deploy, CO2 sensing satellite, so we get global coverage, uh, more frequent coverage. We want also to establish a new sensing network so that we increase the ground network, the ocean surface aircraft in particular in strategic locations. And we also want to measure C14, uh, which is radioactive, so fossil fuel carbon is, has no C14. And so we can, we can figure out this change in the fossil fuel contribution to the CO2 increase in the atmosphere. So what I want to talk about is how do we build our case to that verification, to, to the tool for verification. So the tool, the, 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 what we're doing now is to do carbon data assimilation. So this is borrowed from a lot of other fields, but for me mainly from weather forecasting. So we combine information from imperfect, imperfect models, um, incomplete observations, and then by merging those, we get the best estimate of the, of the meteorological state and the CO2, and then from those, we get the CO2 fluxes. So what we're doing is to start off with a carbon climate model that Bill Collins talked about this morning. So we make, instead of running it in climate mode, which means that go, let it go, respond to the forcing by itself. We have, we make six hour forecasts. Uh, here I, I actually, we're doing 64 calculations at the same time. So we predict wind, uh, temperature, humidity, pressure, and CO2. And then we have observations. And here we are uh, simulating raw weather observations, about a million observations every six hours, and satellite CO2 observations that I'll talk about. 
and we put it into an optimizer. This is a local en ensemble transform Kalman filter. Okay, so we have the best approximation. We find the, the optimal estimation of the wind, of the CO2 from this, okay, and so then we make a new forecast. So this is the optimized state which we will use as the initial condition for the next time step, and we do this every six hours, okay? So, and we do 64 calculations, and all these are done at NERSC, and you've heard a lot about the power, uh, the, the computational power we have here up the hill. So the CO2 satellite that we're using, the data we're using is from air. So this is the thermal, it's an infrared sounder. This was not designed for CO2, this was designed for temperature and humidity, so, but we're using it for CO2. The footprint is large, the, so the footprint about is 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, but it comes overhead twice a day at 1.30 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. So, and because it is a sounder, this is sensing not the CO2 in the entire column, but CO2 halfway up, about 500 millibars halfway up in the atmosphere. So we're trying to figure out what is, in, what is at the surface. So what we're doing is to say we have temperature profiles from the weather stations, we have humidity profiles, we have wind, and we, we, and we merge everything together into a coherent picture. So this is an example. I won't have time to show you all the things that we have gotten out of this. So this is at a particular time on February 27th. And so you see very clearly what we call CO2 weather. Okay, so th this is the 500 millibar height. So you see high pressures and low pressures. You see the winds changing, advecting CO2 from the sources out to the ocean. The ocean exchange, but it's not as strong as the continental sources. And this is one reason why we did not place the, the original sampling site over the land, because this is highly variable. And you can see very clearly the north-south gradient, the northern hemisphere has higher CO2 than the southern hemisphere. This is, and what we also see, and because this is February, there's decomposition, so there's uh, the, the northern hemisphere winter, there's uh, CO2 flux from the soil. So the CO2 concentration in the northern hemisphere is higher than that in the southern hemisphere. And so this is, this is the merging of the satellite data, the, the traditional field data at this height, okay, so about two meters high, and then the satellite data about five kilometers high, and the weather data. So from here, we can, we can then estimate the surface flux, okay, so we have the CO2 data, we have the weather data, and so this is the first look of the, of the, of the data of what we get in terms of the surface fluxes. And this is what the, what, the, what the treaties would ask for, is what are the fluxes at the surface. This is the what we got when we used just the, the, the hundred sites around the world, near surface, near marine stations, and this is what we get by, by using the carbon data simulation system. There's several things to note, and I've only plotted February here, several things to note. One is that we estimate from the satellite data where we have estimated much higher CO2 concentration, from, higher CO2 fluxes from Eurasia. And this is not a surprise because the, the observing the, the CO2 sites are, are upwind, okay, in Tibet rather than downwind of the China emission source. And here using the satellite data, we estimate much higher fluxes. Over the tropics, this was a surprise, and this has to be checked. We don't, uh, they're not, there are no standard CO2 observations here. So the tropics was basically, prior to this, was where we needed to balance the carbon budget. Okay, we don't know where to put it. We put it in the tropics because there are no data to tell us this is right or wrong. So this is the first time when we come in we're seeing that instead of the tropics being a flux in February, it is actually a sink in February, and this is something that we have to figure out what to do. So this is a new thing that we're doing, um, and we can do it because we have the computational power, and this is building on the whole experience of weather forecasting, of the climate modeling that Bill Collins talked about, and what we hope to do with this is that once this is, once we have worked through, the only ones, we are the only group that has, 
attempted this calculation. And so what we hope is that once we have settled to a methodology, then there will be, we'll spin up an international program, share our data, share our approaches to the, to the entire international community, and then figure out how to, how to learn from one another by their different approaches. So all of that is fine. What I talked about, we used AIRS, which has a, the, was not designed for CO2. It was sensing CO2 half a kilo, five kilometers up, and it has a footprint of 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer. What we actually want is the orbiting carbon observatory, which is the design, and you can see just from the name, it is designed for measuring CO2. Okay, so this is using very high resolution spectra. So this is the oxygen A band, the CO2 band, as 1.6 micron and 2.1 micron reflected sunlight. And so it is designed also to have a to wait in the vertical, observe more near the surface than airs which is halfway up in the atmosphere. But more importantly, it was designed to have a very small footprint, about three square kilometers. So this is, it has eight pixels across here. And so the, it, the, the satellite would be taking data at three hertz, so it's traveling at seven kilometers per second. So you can see that in a short time, we can actually see very high resolution uh, footprint at the ground. So it would have a 16 day repeat. Unfortunately, uh, this is still a difficult picture for me. I'm on the science team of OCO. It failed to launch. And so we have worked last year. And so now it has been approved for a reflight and we hope to have it flying in three years. And so then we will have the combination of the large footprint at upper atmosphere, the local, the traditional air sampling uh, at the remote sites, and coupled to a high resolution, to a high resolution satellite, uh, so that this is a simulation we have of a hypothetical <laughs> power plant in the Central Valley, uh, four metric tons of carbon per year. But you can see this would be what the satellite would see, and given OCO, we are hopeful that we can use this, the, the satellite observation uh, to get at what the emission is. And we can go over power plants, we can go over cities, we can have domes over cities. And so from there, using the, assimil the data assimilation system that we're developing to go global uh, and infer where the CO2 is coming from and where the CO2 is going. And if there are carbon capture sequestration activities, we can maybe see if there's an impact on the, on the ambient CO2. But this is still, even at three kilometers, um, it's still not local enough. The chancellor, as I said, chancellor has, has made a commitment to reducing the carbon footprint of campus. How do we know? And so that brings us to local monitoring. And this is, again, I said, this is, this, if we do reduce our electricity consumption, it will not be seen locally, but transportation we can see locally. And so Ron Cohen here in the front row and his student has, is, is developing new sensors. And there's one, uh, can we switch to? the other screen. So this is, we put the, this is the not so success, not, not the, not the PhD <laughs> sensor. This is off the shelf sensor. This is when Charles Marshall breathed on the sensor. And so this is the CO2 in this room. Thank you. So I'm pleased to hear that, uh, I'm pleased to see that there's good ventilation in the room, but CO2 is building up. So if you fall asleep, I don't think it's my problem. It's the <laughs> CO2 is going up. Here, but what you can see is the capability here. The reason for doing this is to show you the capability that we have, we can do the sensing, uh, high resolution. This is taking data two, two second, uh, every two seconds, and we can put all these, and we have developed the technology, David Color somewhere here, so we can do Wi-Fi. All of this can be beaming home. Can we go back to the first one? And so what Ron and his students will be doing is in collaboration with Chabot Science Center in Oakland Unified School District 
to put in not this sensor, which is over there, but um, the CO2 sensors, are a much more accurate sensor and calibrated sensor, I'm looking at Ron, calibrated sensor that will be deployed with other sensors. And so this will be over in collaboration with the Oakland School District. And so we can put it over a high resolution grid uh, um, over Oakland. So this is an illustration of the types of work that we're thinking about uh, to look at using satellites, to look at global CO2, and using the CO2 to, to figure out where the, CO, where the sources are, where the fossil fuel emissions are, where the reduction may be, but also using local, uh, uh, a different kind of an approach, continuous monitoring to give feedback to people, to the students in particular, to see how they could reduce their, the CO2 footprint. Um, here. So I will end um, by saying that we need the self-reported emission is, remains self-reported and verifying that the country or somebody filled out the right form does not give me confidence that they have actually done the reduction. And when there's a lot of money attached, uh, I think we should invest in a verification, in a verification system. And also here, when, the, when I talk about satellites, when I talk about uh, sensing, it's very important to establish baseline emissions. So when we, the satellite will not have a 50-year cycle or 10, you know, it's right now the lifetime is, is, design lifetime is three to five years. So what we hope is to use that system to, to give us a baseline emission so that future reductions can have a, a uniform baseline for against which to compare. What we have demonstrated, what, what we have demonstrated is that we've built a system where we can, we can merge the CO2 and the weather and the weather data so that we can get fluxes at national or, or higher or subnational level. But what we are hopeful about, very excited about, is the local sensing uh, that we can deploy everywhere. Um, so I'll stop right there. Thank you. So we're going to watch the CO2 as we, ask, we answer questions. Um, here, I'll deliver the microphone. I'll do my impression of uh, Phil Donahue or whoever has replaced him recently. <laughs> yeah, the question for the uh, first presentation on uh, CO2 capture. My name is Dr. Avi Patkar. I work for Tata Power. Uh, has there been any uh, pilot scale testing done with actual flue gas where there would be saturation level of moisture, some SO2, some NOx. Have you actually done, carried out any laboratory scale experiments? So we were, we were working on uh, developing the equipment to be able to make these type of tests that started a few months ago. Okay. I, I know this is a little bit of a crazy question, but has anybody ever thought of pumping oxygen down and oxidizing the fuel below the ground as opposed to bringing everything up? I mean, it would seem like a much more logical thing to do if you could figure yeah, out yeah, how to yeah. do it. Those types of studies actually are done to burn coals on the ground, yeah. yeah. They are done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, a, it's a field called in-situ gasification yes, yeah. or underground coal gasification. Yeah. The Russians have done it back in the 30s. Uh, they're not yet succeeded very much. They got one or two plants running. Australians are working on it uh, and Indians are working on it. Actually, Barron, could you comment on um, some of the issues that come into play in actually um, adding carbon capture technology to existing coal-fired power plants and natural gas plants, as opposed to waiting until we design better power plants and that sort of thing? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, those, those studies have been done, and it's, it's, uh, it's basically the, the lifetime of those, those power plants. Uh, they reside there for much longer than people would initially think. So and then retrofitting is basically adding on carbon capture to, to, an, to an existing plant. Uh, however, so, sometimes there, there are uh, very strange constraints. That's the, the amount of space you have from a power plant. And the uh, 
the size of the equipment is about the same size as the existing power plant. And in, in, in many uh, locations, you don't have this amount of space. So there, there are many, many considerations, and then sometimes it's just better, better to build a new one. So uh, again, also with this one, there is no single solution for a, a particular power plant. You have to, to look at it case by case. And for this, this, being able to make these tunable materials would be extremely helpful because for some cases, space is a far more limitation than for other uh, locations. And then you can develop a process which is much more compact in, in, in footprints, uh, physical space, than if you don't have this constraint. So there are many, many issues that play a role. This question might be for me, actually. It's, uh how reliable are the estimates of underground volumes for carbon capture and stores, storage? What are the sources of information? Well, I referred. Want me to yeah. <laughs> uh, I just came back from a conference called the Greenhouse Gas Technologies Conference in Amsterdam last week. And this was a, uh, one of the topics that received a fair amount of attention. So the thinking on this has evolved over the years. Initially, it was uh, started out with just identifying the appropriate types of geologic formations underground and estimating their volumes. Now, the, the kind of formation you want is a sandstone because the grains are relatively large and the, there's a relatively large amount of space in between the grains, and it's also very permeable so you can push the CO2 into it. Uh, but you want the sandstone to be overlain by a fine grain sedimentary rock, a shale usually, that will keep the CO2 down there and act as a seal on the CO2. So you're looking for geologic situations that, are, uh, that have those, that package. And actually, it's best if you have more than one layer above the sandstone that could act as a seal, because if there's a, a break in one of them, you can get, uh, have backups. The other issue is that uh, in order to keep the CO2 in the supercritical state, the depth has to be greater than about one kilometer. So they're looking at targets between about one kilometer and three kilometers below the surface because drilling costs get too high if you get uh, below that. So once you've got that figured out, then the question is how much of that pore space that you can identify as being a rock formation can you actually fill with CO2? And the numbers on this are evolving rapidly. And in fact, there was a talk by a fellow from uh, Shell uh, in uh, Australia, and they um, mentioned that the latest est uh, estimates used to be they thought they could use a few percent of the available pore space, and now when they actually work it through in more detail, it looks like they can only use a few tenths of a percent of the available pore space. So it is true that the estimates of underground storage capacity are still evolving, but um, I don't think we would run out of capacity for many decades after starting. Um, there's plenty of space down there. The initial numbers were larger than we needed by a factor of probably 10 to 50 or maybe even 100. So they're getting smaller, but they're still pretty large. We do one more question. Let's see. Yeah, we have time for a few more questions. Inez, on the, on the measurement of carbon production on your local site, since carbon is also being absorbed locally by, say, vegetation, uh, what you're actually measuring is the difference between what's yes. produced and absorbed. Oh, yes. and, and people yes. who live near forests are getting off cheap. They're producing more than someone else, but it's not showing up on your measurement. Uh, what I did not include in this talk are new, new techniques, LIDAR techniques for measuring biomass on the land. Uh, what we, so we can, if if we're actually planting trees, we can see the accumulation of carbon above ground. What we are challenged with at the moment is to figure out what is the carbon in the soil, how the carbon in the soil is changing uh, on a large scale, not just where we go out and measure at the local site. That, that is the major unknown. And because of that difficulty, we're looking at the measurement, not just of CO2, but of C13, C14, and other gases so that we can build the story. But the major unknown is really the changing soil carbon inventory. Another question? Behind you. With the techniques that you're evolving, would you be able to tell how much a country is emitting in a given time period? And also, would you be able to use this in any way for carbon uh, credit markets? 
I would be hopeful at this stage, and I will not answer yes, but we're hopeful, depending uh, not for large, for the difference between US and Canada will be a bit challenging. Uh, but I think for a country like China, we can, we can, we can bound, give you uncertainty in the emission. So carbon capture, and I think this is the challenge, is, uh, is, uh, is cap and trade. How do you verify cap and trade? And this is where the local, you know, so, so where the, so tracking the carbon and then using atmospheric CO2 as a verification. Uh, uh, in California, we have two tall communication towers. One is the Sutro Tower and another yes. one in Walnut Grove that have been measuring CO2 and other gases for the last three or four years. Uh, do you think that's a better strategy than to use ground level measurements? I mean, is using tall towers a better strategy than just using ground level measurements? My concern is that the ground level measurements The, the are ground level measurements, challenge really is footprint. Mauna Loa was chosen on the, on, the, on the island of Hawaii because of the prevailing wind, so it would integrate the northern hemisphere and because it is in the, the mixing between the hemispheres, it would be much more integrative. What we have learned from the tall towers, and this is com instrumenting communication towers that may be as high as 500 meters high, uh, or Sutro Tower, is that the footprint, the local footprint, footprint, maybe several tens of meters or maybe one kilometer. So again, it's the issue of the, of the interpretation. There is absolutely no way you can instrument the entire world with tall towers. So satellite would be the way to, to get global coverage. I think that what we're advocating is a, the everything. We're not we're not going for one technique versus another. We're putting everything together. Okay, we're uh, scheduled for a 15-minute break at 2.30, and miraculously, it is 2.30. So I think we'll take this break and reconvene at 2.45, and Arun Majumdar will be the next speaker, the uh, current uh, director of ARPA-E.